All right. I want to tell you guys a quick story about the worst vacation I've ever been on. Uh -oh. oh, yeah. I want you to even think about, like, what was the worst vacation I've ever been on? So let me share with you uh, the worst vacation. I'm actually going to ask the team to show the first photo of this vacation, if you can, of our family, because this looks like a great picture, right? Looks like we're having a great time. This is me and my wife and our two kiddos. Our third kiddo was buried in my wife's womb at that time. So uh, we have Brave, Raven, and Quinn. He's, uh, he's in there somewhere, but he's not, he's not visible. We went with uh, our friends, um, Jake and Becca, a lot of you guys know them. We went with them to uh, Colorado a few, couple years ago. And um, the tr getting to Colorado, getting, being in Colorado, let me just say this, was great. Getting to and from Colorado was not so great. I, uh, I discovered this thing after this trip called um, doing routine maintenance on your car. I, I didn't know. I didn't know that was the thing that people did before going on trips. And so uh, we had everything packed. We're ready to roll. My wife did such a great job preparing, like, you know, this, uh, this igloo, what's it called? Ice chest? Uh, cooler full of snacks. And we're on our way, and we're, we enter, you know, it's like a seven-hour drive, eight-hour drive from Nebraska into, into Colorado. And we enter into Colorado, and of course, the engine light comes on, bing! And all of a sudden, our car's doing like, <laughs> and it's like, I don't know, it was like what, like eight, nine o'clock at night, it's getting dark out, and I'm just thinking like this, of course, of course! Of course this is happening. We're, we're, we're like a few hours away from our destination in the mountains. And um, the car breaks down. We, get, we pull over under the shoulder. And kids are crying. I'm like, we have to call an Uber XL to fit all of our kids in all of the car seats. And we're just on the side of the road. And I'm like, we need to get a hotel now. And, like, and then I can't even get the car seat out. I'm like punching the car seat. Like it's not my finest moment as a Christian. But I was, I was just, I was done. I was just done. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. So we ended up taking, we had to like take uh, this Uber to a hotel, had to get the car towed to a dealership, had to like rent another car to go finally make it to the mountains. And then the plan was like, okay, once the car gets fixed after our trip, we're gonna come back down, swap out the rental car for our van, and then we're gonna drive back to Nebraska. So I was like, okay, worst part of the trip over with. Now like we're smooth sailing. Oh Hell yeah. <laughs> so we finished our trip. We swap out the cars, and we're headed back to Nebraska. And then all of a sudden, bing! <laughs> Engine light comes on. I'm thinking, like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, we just left this thing at a dealership. Like, they, they said, yeah, it's all fixed. Everything was under warranty. You're good to go. And we're like, yes, awesome. All of a sudden, <laughs> And I'm telling you, we're in the middle, like, you, have you ever taken that drive from, Color, from uh, Nebraska to Colorado? There's a period of like four hours where it's just corn. Can I show you, go to the next picture. Just corn. There isn't a cell tower anywhere. I'm looking, like, the car is like, I'm like, it's happening again, Joy, it's happening again. And I'm like, I'm trying to pull up my phone to call AAA. I also didn't realize that AAA memberships don't automatically renew. <laughs> yeah, I was, like, someone needs to write a blog for new dads, like, going on <laughs> trips. Oh, like, 10 mistakes to avoid going on your trip with your family. And so, I don't have, I don't have a AAA membership. There's no cell service. There's literally nothing in sight. And I'm just like, this is absolutely my worst nightmare. I just want to get home. Wake up. I got to wake up. I have to be dreaming. This can't be real. And then there's this one exit ramp. And I was like, oh my God. Okay, so I'm taking this one exit ramp. There's this one farm in the middle of like 4,000 square acres of corn. We pull in and, and uh, basically it was this, I don't, I'll spare you some of the details. It was this long saga of like, they ended up helping us call a tow truck. The tow truck came from like 40 miles away. They took us to this place. They tried to uh, fix the car. I'm like, sure enough, we're about to be back on the road. After three hours at the repair shop, they're like, hey, we got to take it to the nearest Toyota dealership, which is another 50 miles away in Fort Morgan, Colorado. So let's just see the next picture. What do we got here? 
So here's our family, no car seats, sitting in the back of a tow truck, <laughs> driving, like we're just, and it's just racking up uh, all these bills. We're staying at a holiday in that night. Finally get to the Toyota dealership. They were at the Toyota dealership, next photo. We're at the Toyota, Toyota dealership <laughs> for like four hours. No clean clothes, smelly diapers, that's Raven, just, she looks like she got kidnapped, so, and I'm just like, dude, we gotta, we gotta get out of here, we gotta, I told them, I, how long is it gonna take, they're like, oh, we only have one mechanic today, I was like, ma'am, just give me whatever car you can, I gotta drive back to Nebraska, so, we, she gives us a car, and then basically we figured it all out, but it was worst vacation I've ever been on. I have a friend, his name is, uh, his name is Brett Elliott. Anybody like Brett Elliott in here? He's a good dude. Uh, I don't think this quote's from him, but I'll attribute it to him because I've heard him say it. So it was once said, but I'll give, the, I'll give the kudos to Brett Elliott. Schedule maintenance for your equipment, or your equipment will schedule maintenance for you. <laughs> Come on. Wow. And the question that I believe the Lord wants to ask us today is, how well are you scheduling maintenance for your soul? Ooh. We live in an overstimulated and underdisciplined culture. You've probably heard uh, Pastor Mike, Pastor OC, say that before. And, uh, and while the, the world applauds busyness, the world treats busyness like a badge of honor. But what the Lord spoke to me this week was in the kingdom, busyness is a blemish. And the reason why the Lord would say busyness is a blemish is because it's a mark of the world that communicates that, that we're illegitimate children of God, that, that we have to work for our inheritance. But when we are truly children of God, there is an inheritance that is incorruptible, that is reserved for us, not because of our efforts, but simply because we're his children. And, and this isn't to shame anyone, this isn't to judge anyone, but, but when we live an over-busy life, what we're communicating to God, to ourselves, and even to the world is that we don't belong. We gotta figure it out on our own. We don't have a heavenly father that would provide for us. And so what I believe God wants to do with this message, and I'm gonna have to sit down for it because I have, I have so many things I gotta share. I believe the Lord wants to break the bondage of unholy busyness so that we can access the abundant life that Jesus paid a high price for us. You might be thinking, I'm not really that busy of a person. I, I, you know, I rest pretty well. I know how to kick my feet up and watch TV and da 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 da. Let me ask you this. Here, here's some areas where you might be striving and you don't need to raise your hand, but I really want the Holy Spirit to do some work in us and let's be real with him about where we might be striving in our lives. Are we striving at work to get a promotion? Are we striving at starting a business and finding a great product market fit? Are we striving to get into the right school? Maybe for some of the students in here. Are we striving to get in shape for the summer? Striving to lose some weight? Are we striving to get healed from a chronic illness? Are we striving to get pregnant? Are we striving to fit in? Are you striving to make your parents proud? Are you striving to get a new home? Are you striving to rebuild a broken relationship? Or are you striving to redeem a tarnished reputation? Hey, there's nothing wrong with pursuing these things. These are good things. But sometimes our pursuit of these things can cause more wear and tear on our soul than we realize. And as we pursue these things in an unhealthy manner, we actually kind of push them further and further away from us. Here's what I've realized. And here's gonna be the title of this message if you're taking notes. When all of our work doesn't work, rest works. You write that down, rest works. We're gonna be in Psalm 127 today. I just wanna read it all for you. It's a pretty short chapter, but it's powerful. So I'm gonna start with verse one. It says, unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects the city, guarding it with sentries will do no good. It is useless for you to work so hard 
from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat. For God gives rest to his loved ones. And here's where it takes an interesting turn, and we'll, we'll dive into this in a second, so don't tune out. Really lean in. This is a really peculiar second half of the scripture. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hand. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. He will not be put to shame when he confronts his accusers at the city gates. Hard work is great, guys. I'm not here to say, like, let's be lazy, let's not work hard, let's not be diligent. The Bible says that we're, we're to do all things heartily as unto God and not to man. We wanna be good stewards. But here's the question that I think we need to ask ourselves is, as we are pursuing anything, is the return that we're getting out of it less than we're putting into it? To me, that is a huge indication that there's something off. Because in Jesus' kingdom, God's economy is not additive, it's multiplicative. Meaning there's an exponential growth in God's kingdom. When we operate according to God's kingdom, when we sow one, we get back 10. When we sow one, we get back 100. And that's not just financially. That's in our peace, that's in our relationships. And when we're not experiencing that, might God be growing us in patience? Sure. Might God be growing us in perseverance? Sure. Might God be doing some growth underneath the surface that we can't yet see and it hasn't come out of the ground yet? Absolutely. But we need to really be honest with ourselves and ask the question, I've been doing this thing in this pattern for a long time and I'm not reaping kingdom results. Is there something off? Am I operating according to God's grace or am I out of God's grace? And the reason why God cares about this math for our sowing and our reaping is because when he does it, only he can get the credit for it. That's why God is, is so after a great return on anything that we're pursuing so that he gets the glory. That way we can't say, oh, well, I put in this many hours at work. That's why I got the promotion. Or I figured out all of these methods or I, I dressed this certain way to attract that guy and that's how I got him to ask me out. No. We, we serve a God that wants all of the glory and he will not share it with any of us. And I'm telling you, man, you know what's amazing? Is when we live that way, it's actually freeing. It's amazing. It's amazing when everything in our lives, when my spouse, when my house, when my car, when my job, when my kids, when my relationship, when my healing, every, everything I have in life prophesies of who God is and what he's able to do in somebody else's life. That's the type of story that God wants to invite us into. Here's the four questions we're gonna answer today, okay? Because we wanna live a life of abundance. We wanna live a life where we're experiencing this amazing power that happens only when we are resting in him. Not resting for rest's sake, but resting in him. The first question we're gonna answer is, am I too busy? Am I really too busy? Or am I, am I, being, am I deceiving myself and thinking that I'm not too busy? The second question is why? Why am I so busy? Why do we get so busy as people, even as children of God? How do we know rest works? That's gonna be the third question. And the fourth question we're gonna answer is, how can I enter his rest? How do I actually enter into the rest that Jesus paid a high price for me to enter? First question, am I too busy? The story that I shared, I think it's, it's really, it's such a powerful illustration in the dashboard. The lights on the dashboard. I'm really grateful that we have cars with dashboard lights on them because those dashboard lights communicate to us something is wrong. And this should hopefully challenge somebody in here. You've been looking at that change oil light in your dashboard for too long. Maybe it's a teenager. Hey, I used to be that way. I was like, oh, it'll work itself out. No, it doesn't work itself out. You gotta go and take care of that thing, right? It's not like a phone where you can just kind of reset it. Like, there's a reason why that dashboard light is on, and we need to pay attention to that dashboard light. Well, God has actually pre-programmed us with dashboard lights in our lives. And if we're not paying attention to these dashboard lights, we're going to miss the areas of our lives that God's saying, hey, there's more for you here. There's a grace that I want to extend to you. You're too busy here. You're wearing yourself down. Here's some of the areas. Number one, there's a physical dashboard light. 
We can know that we're too busy when, when we feel it straining us physically. We just read it right here. Psalm 127, verse two. It says, it is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat, for God gives rest to his loved ones. Is it really hard for you to rest? Do you, can you feel that? Can you feel like it's really hard for me to shut things down on the weekend, one day a week? It's really hard for me to sleep? Maybe I'm speaking to somebody else in here. You can't even remember the last time you had a good night's sleep. Could there be some physical stuff going on that isn't related to rest? Sure, but let the Holy Spirit speak. He'll, he'll confirm it. Is there any striving in your soul that's creating this, anx this anxiousness, this anxiety, that's keeping you from getting the sleep that Jesus wants to give to you? We gotta ask ourselves, do I, even fe do I feel physically worn down in this season? Number two, emotionally. We have an emotional dashboard that so many of us, if we're quite honest, we function our way through. We don't pay attention to how we feel, especially for men in here, honestly. I can, I can attest to that. It's like, hey, I don't, like, yeah, we don't wanna be consumed with how we feel. We don't want our feelings to get in, in the way of the responsibilities that we need to fulfill. However, too much of that for too long can actually harden us, make us callous, make us ineffective in the work that we're supposed to do, and can actually cost us in every other area of our life, especially relationally, which isn't fruitfulness at all. I love this, it says in the NKJV, it says, um, instead of where it says, it is useful for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat, in the, in the New King James Version, it says, eating the bread of sorrows. I want you to write that down, eating the bread of sorrows. Do you just feel sad? Do you just feel sad in this season? My five-year-old Brave, he's, he's, a, he's a really sharp kid, really, he, and he's like a, got a great disposition, and he's really steady. He's a pretty steady kid. But at night sometimes, like, he just starts, he just loses it emotionally. Like, he's crying over, the, like, the silliest things, and I'm like, dude, the kid's tired. The kid's worn down. He, he loses control over his emotions because he hasn't gotten proper rest. Guys, there's no difference between adults and kids. We're just big kids. We're the same. And so if you feel yourself like, man, I'm more irritable, I'm more angry, I, I feel depressed. Here's what's crazy. You remember the story about Elijah? Elijah the prophet, he goes and uh, is an amazing man of God, has this showdown between him and these prophets of Baal, Jezebel's prophets, and he's, they're like, hey, who's, you know, there's this massive drought, and they're like, who's gonna call down God from fi or, uh, fire from sky, the sky? Oh my gosh, get my English together. Who's gonna, who's God will bring down fire from heaven, the, the prophets of Baal are saying their false God's gonna do it, and Elijah's like, watch my God do it. And then obviously Elijah wins, because you know, Yahweh's the one true God, God brings down this fire. Jezebel comes against um, Elijah and intimidates him and says, hey, I'm gonna send these prophets to come and kill you because of what you did. Elijah runs away after humiliating and actually exterminating a th like thousands of false prophets, has one lady come at him with an intimidation, and all of a sudden he's running and, he, and he, he confesses to the Lord, he's like, I'd rather be dead. I don't wanna do this anymore. Intimidation and honestly, like a, an exertion of pouring out himself spiritually left him in a very vulnerable state and his, the fruit of it was depression. And you know what God's prescription was through this angel? Take a nap, you need a snack. <laughs> Literally, like, take a, take, take, sleep under this tree, sleep, eat this bread. Then go back to sleep and eat this bread. And let me tell you, this, this is gonna free some people up who think that spirituality in your life with Jesus is just work after work after work after work. Hey, we're invited in the sacrifice. There's a tension to this. There's a tension to this. I love this quote. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap and eat a snack. I really, but that, that like, there's, there's some humor to that, but there's also some, there should be some severity to that for you. God wants to free you up. Some of my most amazing moments in, in worship, I've been singing my guts out. Dan, you, you see me, I'm a Mexican jumping bean, Latvian jumping bean, just jumping up and down over here in the front. Some of my most amazing moments were when God's like, stop dancing and stop singing. And I just sit, 
And he just washes over me and he says, I don't need you to do a thing for me. I just wanna love you. Some of you have been battling depression and the answer for you just might be some rest. You just need rest in this season. Spiritually, you might be feeling like you're growing distant from the Lord. You feel like your prayers aren't being answered. You're not connecting with him like you used to. And let me tell you this, the enemy will use busyness to distract you and me from our true ministry. And, he'll, and, and, and I'll tell you this, this is what's amazing is, the, enemy, the enemy's in a hurry. Jesus is never in a hurry. In fact, Jesus' restful state offended so many people. You remember when he was on the boat when the storm was happening and he was literally taking a nap? And all the disciples were like, Jesus, what are you doing? And Jesus, he's not tripping. Jesus' friend Lazarus dies and he shows up late, four, late, four days later. Everyone's upset that Jesus didn't come soon enough. And I'm not, hey, I'm not saying it's okay just to show up late to work. That's not what I'm saying here. But what I'm saying is Jesus models for us that the kingdom is an overflow of a restful state. Laziness is a terrible witness to the world, but so is busyness. Because busyness, communi it, busyness communicates a lack of peace. And we live in a world that's in a frenzy. The world doesn't need a, to look at a church that's in a frenzy. The world needs to look at a church that's at peace, that's at rest in the midst of chaos going on, going on around us. Finally, generationally. Now, I, I really want to be sensitive to this because I know that there's, there's a lot of people in here who've been, you want kids. And for whatever reason, the Lord hasn't opened up your womb yet. And I'm praying, I just want to ask the Lord right now that he would that he would supernaturally open your womb and give you the desire of your heart because we read right here that, that kids are a reward from the Lord. But I also wanna give a healthy challenge, I'm not coming in judgment, but a healthy challenge, that the Holy Spirit convict if this is for you, that so many of us are putting off generational impact because of a desire to pursue a career, because of our busyness. I wanna share with you a graph real quick. This graph was put together, it was in The Economist, it's put together by uh, OECD and the UN Population uh, Dynamics Committee. This is the replacement rate. What's the replacement rate? For any population of any country, for it to continue to grow and go in a positive direction, you have to have a population replacement rate of 2.1, which means that for every couple, they have to have 2.1 kids, because, I mean, on average, because you can't have 0.1 kids, right? But the point of it is, it's, it's basic math, because when those parents pass away, if they're only leaving one kid, you're taking away two for every one that you're replacing. But if, you're, if, you're, if two go away and there's two to replace them, or 2.1, you're continuing to grow a population. The US, it's that dark blue line, it might be a little bit hard to see. For the past, like over a decade, couple decades, we've been below the replacement rate. Meaning, if we continue this trajectory in a few decades, we're not gonna have a nation anymore. But this is an amazing opportunity for Christians because I'm telling you, there's no easier built-in discipleship model than parents raising Christian kids. And so we can, we can get up in arms and, and be concerned about the future of this nation. And yeah, Jesus is coming back. We gotta be prepared for that. I'm excited for it. I hope you guys are excited for it. But while we are here, we wanna live with the urgency that he could come back tomorrow, but the wisdom of preparing like he's gonna come back in 50 to 100 years. And what could happen if 50 to 100 years from now, if we look at the landscape of this nation and you have a whole new generation where the majority of them are spirit-filled and self-fed, know who they are or are on a mission to go reach a lost and dying world? What could happen? Are we, what's the word? Are we pushing back the potential for generational impact because of our busyness, okay? Here's the irony. The irony is that we avoid rest to fix things that only rest can fix. Isn't that interesting? We, wanna, we don't wanna rest because we gotta work. We don't wanna rest because we gotta figure out how to heal our chronic illness. We don't wanna rest because we gotta make sure I gotta be noticed by that guy or that girl. But isn't it amazing that, that God supernaturally made provision in our rest, our rest works for us. It works for us in a supernatural way that doesn't make sense. But again, it's so that he can get the glory for it. 
We're gonna fly through this part. Why am I so busy? Here's, here's a few things that might be the, the root for why we're experiencing these symptoms in our lives. The dashboard lights, they just, they just reveal symptoms, but what's the root? The root might be our insecurity. We need to feel accepted by other people. We wanna make sure that, you know, I, got, I can't turn my phone off on the weekend because I, I don't wanna seem like I'm lazy to my clients. Fear of failure. Well, if I, if I don't work seven days a week, then I'm not gonna be able to provide for my family. Greed, a lack of contentment, not being, not being satisfied with what God has given us to enjoy in the moment. Lust, lusting after the things of this world, trying to satisfy our flesh, trying to live a life of pleasure above living a life that honors God. Unbelief, unbelief that God can actually do more with less from us. And then finally, cowardice. Sometimes I work, honestly, I work so that I don't have to do the thing that I don't wanna do. Sometimes I work so I don't have to confront the person I need to confront. Because it's so much easier for me to do the thing that I can control rather than address the thing that I feel like I'm totally out of control of. Even though control is an illusion in the first place. But here's what's amazing, is that when we rest in the Lord, he addresses all of these issues. I don't need to worry about the fear of man. I, I, my insecurity is actually solved in rest because Jesus reveals himself as the one who accepted me before the foundations of the earth. My fear of failure to provide for my family. I, I discover on the day of rest, when I position myself in a place of rest, God reminds me that he's Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Greed, feeling like I, I can't get enough and I'm not satisfied. Godliness with contentment is great gain. The Holy Spirit reminds me of this when I'm in a state of rest with him. Lust, not being able to satiate my own desires. The Holy Spirit gives us the fruit of self-control when we're rested in him. Unbelief, you remember the guy who said, uh, he said, Jesus, I, I believe you can heal my son. I believe, but help me in my unbelief. God can increase a measure in faith in us, but he can't when we're in a state of busyness. And courage. God wants to increase boldness and courage in us, but we need to make the decision, I'm gonna make myself available in a place of rest to receive this from him. How do we know rest works? We're identifying that we could be busy people and why we might be busy people, but how do we know that rest actually works? There's four things here. Number one, Jesus invented rest. It says in Genesis chapter two, verses one through three, so the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. This is when God's creating the whole earth. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. It was God's idea. It's not man's idea because we're burnt out. God instituted rest before he, as he's creating the whole cosmos. Because God needs rest? No, because he knows that we need rest. Second thing, he commands rest. This is amazing. Think about the 10 commandments here. I'll just, uh, for the sake of time, Think about the Ten Commandments. You guys probably know them. You, you shall have no gods before me. That's the first one. You shall, have no, you shall uh, make no false images, no graven images of me. You shall not take the Lord's name in vain. You shall honor the Sabbath rest, the day of the Sabbath. You shall honor your mother and your father. You shall not murder, uh, steal, lie, bear false witness, uh, commit adultery, or covet. Am I missing one? Anything? Covet your neighbor, okay? What's amazing is out of all these 10 commandments, it's so easy for us to make a case of like, well, of course I'm not gonna murder. Of course I'm not gonna steal. Of course it's not a good idea to, to dishonor my mother and my father. But we in Western culture, we make so many excuses for why we don't honor the Sabbath. At last time I checked, Jesus never abolished the Sabbath. Even in Romans 14, you see that Paul preaches and he says, hey, some of you want to worship God on Saturday or Sunday or whatever day of the week. It doesn't really matter which day. Just pick a day. Just consecrate one day to the Lord. Why? Because God needs it? Because God needs us to worship him on one day? No, check out what Jesus said in Mark 2, 27. Then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of the people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. This is how good our God is. He commands this for us for our benefit, 
so that we can be realigned and reconnected with him. We, we know that he blesses the Sabbath because he commands it, that's the third. And the fourth thing is he is our rest. We know that rest works because Jesus is our rest. It says in Mark 2, 28, so, son, the, so the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. Jesus is our Sabbath rest. So we got a lot of information here, okay? I know this, this is like, this is hopefully challenge. Is somebody getting anything out of this? Are you being challenged and being stirred up? This is so good. This is so good for our own personal healing and also for our, our ministry and what God's called us to do in this city, in this country, in this community, in the globe. For us to be a people that are filled and, and operating and overflowing from a place of rest and living in the abundant life that Jesus paid such a high price for us to live. But how do we get there practically? So here's the fourth and final question. How can I enter his rest? It takes faith. Let me just tell you that. It takes faith, and here's the irony of it. It takes some effort. This is what it says in Hebrews chapter 4.11. You might not see it on the screen, but write this down. Hebrews 4.11 from the New King James Version. It says, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Here's the three things that we need to do. We, need, we know that we need to be diligent to enter that rest. You're gonna like this. PT's gonna like this because it's three P's. He likes anything with the same letter, right? We need to prioritize it. We need to plan it, and we need to protect it. What do I mean by that? We need to prioritize it. We need to put it in our calendars. Yeah. It sound, this is gonna sound so basic, but we need to put it in our calendars, and we need to make the decision, I'm not gonna receive calls from work that day. I'm not gonna go run unnecessary errands that day. I'm prioritizing this for my sake, for my family's sake, for my community's sake, and for the generations after me. Like, this is such a big deal that we take this seriously. We need to prioritize it. How do we prioritize it? Here's three ways. First hour in the morning. Anybody in here with kids under five like me, and, and you know what it feels like to be thrust into chaos because you snoozed through your alarm and you didn't spend time with the Lord in the morning. And then what? And then your kids and your spouse are getting your scraps. And you're just trying to do your best to grit your teeth and not blow up on somebody. We're not operating out of an overflow of abundance. We're trying to survive. That's not the way of the kingdom. We need to prioritize that first hour in the morning. And that's going to be a sacrifice. But you know what's great? When we prioritize it, number two, we begin to plan around it. You start to go to bed a little bit earlier. If Saturday's your day off, that's what the Lord's been convicting me of recently. I've been terrible at this. This is why I'm preaching to myself, because I live this. I live this. I live the fruit of eating the bread of sorrows for months and in even a couple years. And God had to really grind me down and show me like, hey, you, you don't know the fruit of this 10 years from now. Do you still want a marriage? Do you want a relationship with your kids? Take this seriously now because you don't know what it's, what it's gonna do for you. The wear and tear, you're gonna, be, you're gonna be on the side of the road in the cornfields of eastern Colorado. <laughs> I'm speaking metaphorically here. With no cell service, wondering how did I get here? If only I had scheduled some routine maintenance for myself before this. We need to protect it, that's the third P. I'm telling you, man, when, when, you, when you schedule and prioritize rest, the enemy is gonna do whatever he can to come and rip it away from you because he, know that, he knows that a rested church is a powerful church. Wow. A rested church is a powerful church. One thing that I do practically that I've actually followed after PT, he's been working with this guy for years. This guy has taught me faithfully, shut down your phone. Shut down your phone on your day of rest. And I'm like, yeah, I'll do everything but that. <laughs> the challenging thing practically with our devices is like entertainment and true rest is literally one swipe away from work for a lot of us. And I even had one day where I had my phone on and, and like a notification from my, my, uh, my messages came through and I literally, beep, 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 engine light, 
physical, the physical dashboard light, I felt my cortisol levels rise up. And I had to like shut it down and I had to be like, whoa. From one text message for work and all of a sudden, <gasps> I'm like in a, this adrenaline state where I have to go and solve this problem. And I'm like, now I have to take an hour to come down off of that. You better believe that doing that over time takes away from the, from the return that God wants to bring us throughout the week. We need to protect our rest at all costs, regardless of what other people think about us. For some of us, it's gonna be like, man, I don't wanna be perceived as lazy. I don't wanna be perceived as not being diligent. I don't wanna be perceived. Who are we serving? Paul said in Galatians 1.10, hey, if I was a pleaser of men, I wouldn't be a servant of God. And for me, I wanna be in this for the long haul. I want, if Jesus wants to see fruit that lasts, that we bear fruit that lasts, that we're not just a firework that blows up and is pretty for a moment, pretty and loud for, for a second and then disappears. I believe God wants to create a, in, in us a burning people that sustain, like PT preached last week, sustain revival and operate from a place of peace. I'll tell you this, I just wanna honor our pastor because I, I, um, I wasn't even gonna think about putting this in my notes, but I've seen our pastor prioritize rest these past couple years in ways that I've never seen him prioritize it, and I'm seeing him lead from a place of health and overflow and abundance. His preaching has never been better. His vision has never been better. I watch his relationship with his wife, and I'm like, oh my gosh, what an example of what we can have. I just wanna honor you guys, because you know what it is? You've been diligent to enter his rest. And I'm just honored that you guys are such a living example. I wanna close with this illustration and we're, we're gonna wrap this up, but um, I, we, had a, we recently had a great redemption of a vacation. <laughs> I have a friend, his name's Isaiah Brandt. He's a, one of the young adults in our ministry. He, he, uh, we grabbed uh, breakfast one day and he said, dude, I've had a couple dreams about you. I wanted to share them with you. And in these dreams, I was standing on a rock in the middle of this body of water and um, and my family was behind me on the rock, and in the distance I saw these, like, these, these tropical islands, like, like uh, places of paradise, places that I wanted to take my family to. And I was like trying to step into the water to figure out how to get to any one of these islands, hoping that some sort of path would like, present itself. And I kept on st uh, stepping in, and like, I kept on like, falling into the water, and I wasn't like, making any traction, getting any progress. And then all of a sudden I stopped and the Lord told me in the dream to close my eyes and I closed my eyes and while my eyes were closed, the Lord actually placed my family on one of those islands and then allowed the path to that island to just surface to the top of the water. And in that moment, I didn't need someone to interpret it for me. I knew exactly what the Lord was speaking to me because I'd been going through seasons of striving to figure out how do I position my family in a way that's, that's gonna be great for my wife and uh, great for my kiddos and just giving them a great future and it really a lot of it had to come with work and occupation and just like stepping in, trying to honor God, trying to do the right thing, trying to do it in my own strength and meanwhile I'm like, my gosh, like my family's just stuck on this rock behind me and the Lord speaks to me in that moment and is like, if you would prioritize rest, like reverse engineer this thing. Reverse engineer the abundant life. Like, you're, like, be there. Don't work towards it, work from it. Rest in me, watch me place your family into this place that you've been wanting to put them all along, and I'll show you the path to how to sustain it. I will give you the actual practical strategy with your business and your job to do it. But you need to prioritize rest. I left this breakfast meeting with, with uh, Isaiah, and I texted my wife, and I was like, you gotta plan for us a trip to Texas in a few weeks. Just do whatever, whatever it takes. Find some friends to hang out with. We'll pack the car. I'll do a, a maintenance check on the car before we go. I'll check AAA, make sure we got that. I've, <laughs> I learned all this stuff the hard way. But let's schedule this trip. And I'm telling you, this trip was so, like, it was unspectacular. It wasn't an expensive trip. But we broke out of the rhythms of our busyness to just make some core memories with our kids and, and, it, and I'll tell you what, like even just being behind a windshield for eight hours, God was just ministering to me. He was just pulling junk out of my heart. He was healing me. He was giving me vision. 
fresh vision, fresh excitement. I was getting calls from people. A guy, guy uh, I know a minister in town calls me. He's like, I feel like I just need to pray over you and prophesy over you. And I'm driving and I'm like, please, let's do this. And I'm just like, God's just blessing us. Go to this church upper room in Dallas on uh, the Sunday that we were there and some guy comes up to me, randomly is prophesying over me, confirming the stuff that the guy who prayed over me while I was driving. God's just blowing my mind and, it's just, and I was just like, if I was in a state of chaos and busyness, I wouldn't have been able to receive any of this. I wouldn't be able to hear it. Rest works. It really works. When we feel like we've exhausted every other option, we've worked as hard as we can, rest works. Amen? Amen. God, we thank you so much that rest really does work. We thank you so much that you are our Sabbath rest, that you paid such a high price for us to not operate towards rest, but to, to stay planted in rest, to operate from a place of rest, for, for rest to be the fuel that makes every other part of our lives function according to the kingdom. God, we just ask right now, I just ask in the name of Jesus, if there's anybody, while all ba- heads are bowed, if there's anyone that would say, you know what, I've just been weary. I've just been tired. If you wouldn't mind just raising your hand, I just wanna pray for you. I love it, come on. The amount of hands, if you're not looking and just, you know, no need to look, but the amount of hands I see raised right now just show me that this is, a, this is a word for our church right now. I see the people in the back. I see the people in the back who are just raising their hands, just weary. It might have been the biggest struggle to even get to church today. And I just declare over all of you that he is enough, that he is sufficient that his grace is sufficient for you. Holy Spirit, I ask right now for you to wash over all of these people, over all of us. I pray that the, the dashboard lights that need to come on would be brighter than ever. It would just be so clear. It'd be so clear what adjustments we need to make so that we can stay healthy for the long run, so that we have something meaningfully, meaningful to give away so that we can make a real generational and eternal impact with the lives that you've given us. Holy Spirit, would you just breathe, just breathe, just breathe over your people. Fill us all with a peace that surpasses understanding. Even right now, as I'm praying, there's people that are just, they're getting distracted with the next thing to do. And Lord, we just, we settle ourselves before you. You are the bread of life. We give you the bread of sorrows the bread of our anxious toil. And we say, God, give us the bread of life because when we eat from it, we'll never hunger again. In Jesus' name. Now, before I say amen, I know that 